Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Valuable Power Retail webinar session brought to you today by Bronto Software and eStar. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Pranitha Govinda. I'm the editor of Power Retail, and I'll be introducing our guest speakers very shortly. Before the introduction, some quick housekeeping. Mobile phones, if you could please turn these to silent. I can't ridicule you if it goes off because I won't hear it but that's besides the point. You probably want to pay attention because it's going to be a great session today. At the end of the presentation, we'll have time for questions. You can enter these at any time in the question dialog box on your dashboard, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. We've got a big session ahead this morning, so get comfortable. Consumer behavior is changing, and with these changes comes increased expectations of retailers. The best practice of having traditional lifecycle messages should no longer be viewed as just good enough. These messages need to deliver what consumers expect. Today, we'll be reviewing what some of these changes in consumer behavior are and how they impact some of your business's key revenue-driving lifecycle messages. We have two presenters this morning. Please welcome Greg Zakowitz, Senior Commerce Marketing Analyst at Bronto, and Greg Randall, Digital Strategist at eStar. Hello, everyone. Morning. So... Uh, Greg Randall and myself are very excited to have you guys, and thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to come listen to us uh, talk to you about the evolution and the change in consumer behavior. And that's exactly what we're going to look at, right? If, so if consumer behavior is changing, we should be looking at traditional best practices and things that have worked and been tried and true in the industry and say if consumers are changing, our strategies should be changing alongside those, uh, along with those. So we're going to look at kind of everyday best practices, specifically around welcome series strategies, because that is the first touch net, that onboarding experience that customers will have with your brand, and card abandonment emails, because they are so profitable. They will likely be the pro most profitable emails that you send out. But beyond just looking at emails themselves, we should be looking at what happens after they click through and hit the landing pages, especially with card abandonment and some of those uh, traditional changes in the industry. And then we'll wrap up with some uh, adjustments to lifecycle messages that you can apply for the seasonality as well. Uh, so you have two Gregs for the price of none today, um, which is sound to be exciting, but um, you know, who are the Gregs? So Greg Zakowitz, myself, I uh, work for uh, Bronzo Software, which we have over 1,400 brands worldwide, been 14 years old, acquired by NetSuite in 2015. Uh, we're sending over, as you can see, 20 billion emails per year. And we have offices in, uh, in the States here, Durham, North Carolina, which is where I am, uh, London, Sydney, New York, and Los Angeles as well. So uh, my particular job is to stay abreast of industry trends, right, and present on those trends themselves. Look, thanks, Greg. Um, and look, I'm Greg Randall, and I'm working for um, eStar. And look, before we start talking about today's consumers, I want to quickly talk about who is eStar. And look, eStar is a feature-rich enterprise e-commerce platform, and it's been powering retailers since 1998. Um, and it, today, it powers some of the largest retailers, both in Australia and New Zealand, and currently facilitates over $400 million in revenue annually. eStar has offices in Australia and New Zealand, and within the eStar team, we have in-house design teams, in-house retail strategists, of which I'm a part, and, and a huge, extremely talented development team, uh, I should say teams, based in both New Zealand and Australia. So our clients get this great locality with our, with our development, our project management, and our ongoing strategic support. So it's, 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 it's a great relationship for our clients and our new ones too. All right, so look, we're talking about the con consumer behavior impacts and your life cycle messaging strategy. And before we start getting into that, and, and with Greg Z from Bronto talking more about what, um, what, how the emails contribute to that, I think it's really important that we first touch on today's consumers. And uh, in particular, I want to talk about some two fundamental um, behavioral trends uh, that, that are occurring very recently, um, there's two consumer shifts that retailers need to take notice of. The first one is how consumers engage with email content, and the second one is the consumer behavioral shifts as a result of too much choice. So let's talk first about the um, 
how consumers engage with email content. A recent survey was done that found that 72% of people who are checking their emails do so on their smartphone. And in fact, this number rises to 91% for the 18 to 23 year olds. So the key takeaway point from this is, you may have strong relevant messaging, but if it's hard to read um, and the, the layout is inadequate, that's an opportunity lost essentially. And this actually um, brings to light some important tips that we can talk about very quickly, just with this, this one piece of insight. Uh, and I've got seven to two quickly run through a few now. One is plan your email layouts. I'm gonna talk more about that later on in the presentation. But quickly, number two, as a guideline for layouts, stick with the wide single column format. And what I mean here is don't try to have multiple content elements on a single row. Number three is respect the smartphone fold. <clears throat> this is an important one. And, and look, everybody understands the concept of the fold, but the dynamic of late has changed. And I think it's important for retailers to understand that just because they're reading an email on their smartphone doesn't mean they're automatically going to be scrolling down the page and automatically engage with content. The key point to make here is if the content is relevant above the fold, the content that people can see without scrolling, the assumption is there's more relevant content down below and that assumption will initiate scrolling behavior. If you have garbage up top, the assumption is there's more garbage down. And with consumers, with today's consumers who are time poor, you better make sure that there's relevancy above the fold to initiate that behavior. Okay. Point number four, ensure the images are large enough to be recognizable. Number five, deliver white space. Don't feel you have to cram content together. Number six, make sure the calls to actions are large finger targets. Remembering this is all about the smartphone. And even though the, the finger target it is kind of common sense, you'd be surprised how often it's not happening. And number seven, ensure the font and the calls to actions have strong contrast against its background. And the point here to make is people could be reviewing the email on their smartphone in a bright environment outside in the sun. So this is why you would, as a guideline, steer away from a black background with white font, for example. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Let's talk about the consumer behavioral shifts as a result of too much choice. Consumers are struggling a little bit now to make decisions. And here's two examples of what consumers are facing in today's retail environment, let's say. If a consumer wants to purchase a scarf and they go to amazon.com, they've got over 200,000 to choose from. In Christmas 2015, Google did some research and found that seven out of 10 people received a gift card as a present because of this inability to make decisions. Okay, so this is really interesting and this gives us another good layer of insight in terms of what consumers are facing. And what's happening is consumers are developing shortcuts to help them make decisions when they're presented with too much choice. And this is, this is called, these shortcuts are called consumer heuristics. Now, I'm sure um, some of you may have not have heard of this term heuristics before, but a consumer heuristic is simply this. It's the consumer's approach to simplify their decision making when they're selecting a product. It's like a, it's like a shortcut. It's just a mental shortcut that they're taking. And what Google has found is in the last couple of years, people, consumers are now introducing the word best in their keyword searches when they're looking for products in Google. So two or three years ago, they'd be looking for home theater systems or digital cameras or, or whatever the product may be, large screen TVs, you name it, it's in there. However, what's been happening in the trends from Google, they're reporting that now people are using the word best. So it's the best home theater system or the best dishwasher, which helps them try to get away from this too much choice because they're thinking, well, I want to find the best 
thing anyway, so I might as well search for it. So that brings to light a question. How do consumers determine the best product amongst a large selection? And we as retailers have some um, tactics that we can employ to help customers or consumers pick the best of something that matches their buying intent. And I've got the three main ones here. Customer reviews is the first one. Everybody knows the power of customer reviews. However, in Christmas 2015, Google found that reviewing customer content was one of the most popular actions consumers took while they're trying to find a product. The next one is introducing bestsellers. Now, <clears throat> when retailers introduce bestsellers, that's kind of like a review in the sense that people will think, well, if, the, if other people purchased this product, they may have had the same need that I have right now. So they must be the right product for me. The third one, present products in context. And this is talking about your merchandising strategy. And the, a good example here is if you're selling a home, what scenario would best sell that property? Um, staging a home or having a home being empty with no furniture in it? So this is talking about, you know, um, when you, with apparel, you have pictures with models, product videos showing the apparel in use. Those are the kinds of things I'm talking about, okay? So look, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop now and hand it back to, to Greg Z from Bronto. But I, I'm gonna come back later on in this presentation and talk about cart abandonment emails and how these heuristics can contribute to making these emails a, a very powerful opportunity for retailers. Greg, back to you. So we've seen some of the things that Greg laid out for how consumers are viewing and shopping for different products. And of course, we're not all Amazon on the call today. So what we look at and generally are these lifecycle messages um, that help us differentiate from store A to store B. We want to make sure that people are going to shop with us and not someone else. But there needs to be some sort of uh, purchasing decision that goes into that. And that's where lifecycle messages come in from welcome series, the post-purchase, the card abandonment. You also have promotional messages that come into play here, and this is really where segmentation comes in, product recommendations. The goal is to take data. Consumers expect relevant content with them, whether they're on a uh, website, in reviews, or via email. So this is where that comes in um, with this data point to make emails more relevant. And then finally, social media. It's hard to create a customer experience online, especially if you're an online-only retailer, uh, but social media is kind of that even connector there. So our traditional best practices for email lifecycle messages used to follow those certain rules. But we want to look at our so adapting those best practices, especially with those two series we spoke about, the welcome and the card abandonment, and how to apply them to that change in consumer. So let's start with the welcome series here. A welcome series, again, is designed as that, how do you do it? It's that initial intro. So it's the handshake, it's the nice to meet you, they're going to sign up, and that's the first impression they get. Welcome series, so message two, three, four, five, however many you may have, is really designed to reinforce your brand values and build consumer confidence, hopefully to the point of driving the purchase. So what happens is if you have store A and store B that come together and they both have very similar welcome series, it's my welcome message, it's a social media invite message, it's a uh, manager preferences message, there's nothing really there differentiating your store versus their store. And then you're left with this issue of, hey, how do we uh, influence the purchase at that point? So what we have here is the typical conversation that happens when you're planning out a welcome series. How many messages do we send? What types of messages do we send? And how often do we send those messages? And the two most common messages you'll find in a welcome series are just that the social invite message and the managed preference messages. Well, they may be good for collecting data and it's introducing additional touch points, but they're not necessarily great at differentiating your brand that much. And what you wind up with is something like this. It's a well done welcome message, short to the point, bullet point, but it's doing everything it should do, but it's not really differentiating the brand at that point. So if you go through those traditional questions, say, hey, how many messages do we send? What do we put in the messages? You may wind up with something like this, your traditional welcome, your social invite message, 
and then your last two messages, which in this case do a really good job at setting value adds, but there's a little too much text in there for the mobile-friendly environment now. So while this is good, you may have their competitor or multitude of competitors sending a very similar welcome series. And what happens is when that consumer wants to buy, they either the next day figure out, hey, which email am I going back to? And it might just be a flip of a coin, or they might just go and shop somewhere else altogether because there's nothing memorable about them. So instead, we could take something like this and convert a welcome message into something like this. Now, this may be a ext very extreme version of the message. You're probably not having something with alpacas or sharks with laser beams attached to them shooting out for your general customers. Obviously, it depends on what you sell. But for this brand, it strikes true the emotion of their general consumer. The goal here and the point I'm trying to make is with that welcome message, as opposed to just introducing and reinforcing your brand, you can do that in a way that you're memorable, in a way that you step out of your comfort zone and step out of that box a little bit. So be a little bit different. Doesn't mean you need to go to this extreme, but think about how if you get you versus your competitor, the next day someone goes back to those emails and says, hey, which email am I going to open with and hopefully click and convert through? Give them a reason to choose your message versus other things. When you're building out the rest of the series, there's two things that you can consider to really make your welcome series more relevant to the consumer and really guide them down the purchase funnel. And that's the source of the acquisition and the behavior of the user who actually signs up. So in this instance, if we look at the source of the acquisition, you can see in this example, we're looking at breadcrumbs in the upper left, a men's fitness category, and right in the middle, I've got my sign up for uh, the email program there. Well, that's great for a general user who might be browsing, but what if you have two people browsing a very similar category but with different breadcrumbs. In this case, we're gender specific. One's a men and one's a women. What this allows you to do is if you can capture the source of the sign up, it allows you to customize that welcome message a little bit more. Now you can customize it a lot or you can customize it a little, but knowing just that little piece of info can allow you to do something like this. You have really the same welcome message with the same call to action, but in this case, you have different graphics, you have different verbiage, you have different uh, push points you're trying to get across based on who your actual audience is. In this case, we're going to show a few different men's products, but we're only going to show one women's product. You know, you can test to figure out what's going to work best for you. Now, this is a very simplistic example of what you can do to more customize these messages. But from an initial onset, if I'm a man shopping at a, uh, a mixed gender fashion retailer and I get a female version of a welcome message, it's not as relevant to me. Now, I may be, still be shopping for my significant other or for my wife, whatever it might be, but it's less relevant. In this case, you're doing something very simple to make it more relevant. Now, what you can do with that acquisition source info is two things. One, if you want to send a welcome series that's dedicated to just that individual thing, and that could be gender, it could be category, it could be really whatever, you can then send a series that targets specifically the source where they came in from. So say men's fitness, the rest of my welcome series is geared around men's fitness messaging or the product recommendations are around men's fitness. Remember, the, the important thing here is that at the point that that user is looking at a very specific page of your website, they have decided they want to sign up. They want you to start sending them messages. So there's something on the page that makes you relevant at that point and capturing it allows you to customize a little bit more. Now, to take it one step further, if you analyze the behavior of the user there, it allows you to do a little bit more. So in this case, we look at a welcome message, which is generic, it's branded. Um, but you can see we have three call to actions down there for obviously three different main categories that the brand offers. But you, everyone has a navigation bar in their emails as well. So the two highlighted ones are to the same call to action. Being able to run a segment and saying, hey, if a user gets this and they click on XYZ link, in this case, boxing link, we will then send them a boxing specific message to or welcome series altogether. So the same principles as the acquisition source, but you're using their activity behavior to then classify that. Now you can do this on a just a single series basis, or you can do it on a message to message basis. See, I set up a men's fitness, I get the welcome message, now I click on boxing or I click on uh, the women's category. You can say, hey, they signed up when they were viewing men's products, but maybe it was a female who was shopping for their significant other. They're clicking on women or vice versa in the welcome message. Let's show them some women-specific uh, messaging or product recommendations. So consider the source of the acquisition and consider the behavior of the user when they're getting into the email to help that behavior deliver messaging that is immediately more relevant to them. 
if you get to that point, when you look at yourself versus your competitor who's sending the same welcome series to every person who comes through, hoping it resonates with them, your messaging is that much more spot on, providing a much cleaner and seamless user experience for the new subscriber at that point. The first impression, and it's a very strong impression. Now, hopefully that message drives them to convert, but if not, hopefully you get them at least to the shopping cart at that point. And shopping cart abandonment or basket abandonment kind of falls in the same principle. The conversations you typically have when planning out the series is, hey, how many messages do we send? Commonly one, two, or three. When do we send those messages? One hour after abandonment, 12 hours, seven days, whatever it might be. And do we include an incentive? And if we do, in which message do we put it in? So those are all fine. They're well and good. They're well intentioned. But there's three things that really work side by side and intertwine with one another that allows you to even differentiate this messaging, the card total and set on the number of messages you ultimately send. So we'll start with card total here and look at these two products. They're very different products, very different price points, and chances are the user who's shopping for these two products have very different motivations for buying the product and very different obstacles to actually purchasing the product. But in this case, most retailers will send something like this. We'll send the product recommend or the abandoned cart message here with some product recommendations in there. Now it's really not a, a poorly done message. You can see we have star ratings in here. So going back to Greg Randall's point, people have a lot of trust in the star ratings and the ratings and reviews there. You have an undecided, we can help, great, but not a whole lot of text in there. Hey, don't forget, free shipping off $35 or more. Now my price point's under 35, so it's actually a very relevant call to action for me. Recommendations, I'll give them a pass, they don't make sense to me. $1,400 TV is probably not what the person who's buying twin hour headphones is shopping for. But here's the problem. If I'm shopping for that much more expensive dishwasher, I get the same message. In both cases, it asks me how I can, that they're here to help me. It doesn't really tell me how they can help. Should I be going to the website? Should I be calling a customer service phone number? My also, my verbiage is exactly the same. 35 bucks and I get free shipping. Well, for that $700 dishwasher, that's a wasted message to me. It doesn't matter. If I'm spending that much money, you can expect that I expect free shipping here. What's a lot more relevant to me on the dishwasher purchase is, do you have hallway services? How about some installation services? What are all these different things that I need to know about? Maybe a customer service number to an appliance expert. I don't know the first thing about dishwashers. When I was shopping for one a month and a half ago, I needed to talk to people to say, hey, what about this? What does this rating mean for quietness? All these different things, and at the end of the day, is $20 the same as $700? And the answer is absolutely not. You're gonna have different motivations and obstacles for each of those. So factoring in cart total with your abandoned cart messaging process gives you a lot of options. The three options down below here, completely hypothetical. But if I'm under 100 bucks, let's only send me one reminder message. I'm not gonna give you an incentive. We have our second tier. Maybe I'll up the messages here because I have more value to convey to you. If it's over a specific price point or contains specific SKUs or set of SKUs, maybe I have more messaging. Uh, I put an incentive in there to try to get you, but it's in the third message. These are all things where, as opposed to just saying, hey, you forgot something in your cart, you could have sent a message that said, hey, you left something in your cart. Do you need help completing your order? Here are some our top five rated uh, dishwashers or need to talk through something? Feel free to contact us here. So cart total, very different. There's, there's going to be different value adds to get someone to purchase. It could be return policies. Again, hallway services. It really depends on what your uh, products that you're selling and at which price point. Up next is incentives. So we have this change in consumer behavior, and generally in abandoned card messaging, you have one incentive you give. We'll give you 10%, we'll give you 15 bucks, whatever it can be. Think about mixing and matching these discounts. And one of the trends you're seeing across the industry, um, this is true for Australian clients I've worked with, uh, UK clients and here in the States, are this, is this rise in self-gifting, especially during the holiday season. So people are buying just as much of themselves as they are for other people. That's why you're seeing that early promotional strategy and people buying earlier and earlier in the season happen. Well, think about how you can use that to your advantage. Set some tier discounts or choose your own discounts based on car total and therefore an incentive. So we, if we at 25 and we need to get you over 35, let me make that price, uh, the price break at say $40. So you get free shipping and we'll give you 10% off whatever it can be. So utilize these to your advantage. And again, completely hypothetical example, if we're 100, let's split test some different incentives to find out what people at that price point 
are willing and not willing to accept as either offers or no offers whatsoever. So you can split test these and go with different price points to try to figure out what your audience is going to respond to. This will help you not only in abandoned cart messaging, but also regular promotional messaging or different incentives in different lifecycle messaging strategy as well. And then finally, the number of messages. So the common question is typically, do we send one message, two message, or three messages? And if three messages, you build out that series, maybe the incentive is hidden in the third message, you may see results like this, which are fairly typical, high open rates, click conversion rates, revenue per email, significantly higher than your average revenue per email. And this particular client, 11 cents for a promotional message, their worst performing here is 209. So high volume messages. But we have this immediate impression that there is a cliff once you get to this point. It's someone walking to a cliff, taking a look and saying, oh, there's a big gap there. Let me turn left or let me turn right. I'm going to change my focus and do something else. The fact is, someone's going to come along and say, hey, how about I just build a bridge right over this thing and I'll get there a lot quicker. And that's what happens with card abandonment messages. Clients that send four, five, six, seven messages, probably won't send seven, but you get the point here. There's not that cliff present. If you look at things like this, the conversion rate of message four is higher than the conversion rate of message three. The one thing to think about with additional messaging is you're going to send that contact a message anyways. It's going to be a promotional message, whether it's segmented or just a batch and blast message. You're better off making that message more targeted to them, more relevant to them, and it allows you to kind of set up your messaging where if you have four messages going, maybe message three is just a value add message or a customer service theme message versus a promotion message. So don't be scared to push the boundaries of your traditional best practices and do something that your competitors are. Be bold, be different, be memorable, but do it in a smart and relevant way. So regardless of the, uh, you know, your automation platform, this should be able, you should be able to implement these and put this logic into your actual abandonment or other lifecycle messaging series. We can certainly do it with Bronto here, but certain things to think about from that perspective. So I'm going to turn it back over to Greg. I told you about what to do from a strategy perspective on your actual emails, but what happens when they click through the emails or they get the email themselves? And Greg will give you a little insight into that. Yeah, great. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> so, look, some, some, some great insight and some great guidance there. And I'd like to take what Greg from Bronto has um, basically presented to you and, and just work that into this, this next conversation, which is about cart, cart abandonment landing pages. So before I start, though, let's, let's be clear. The cart abandonment landing page is the email itself. And the reason why this is an important point to make is because many retailers are, um, have constraints around their cart process. And to be able to craft these, these elegant series of messages, it really needs to be done on, on a, a Bronto software. For, for lack of a better word, it's, it's really where it needs to live. So let's let's talk about this. And, and uh, taking Greg's key points out of that, it is all about getting the, the, the action that the retailer wants people to take. But we need to take a step back for a second. And if But if we get the content recipe right and the layout right for the right screen, there is an enormous opportunity. But we need to think about it as what content must we present to pull people back? Because we have to, you have to remember that they left for a reason. And this is why I've pulled together this slide here to show what are some of the most common reasons as to why people are leaving. We need this context to help us understand what the right content recipes are. So, um, and I should also mention that these statistics are only three or four weeks old. They're very new. So um, it's really good to get this update on what's happening with consumer behaviorisms around cart abandonments. 34% are just looking or they're researching. So they could be in early stage buying mode. The next one, 23%. Issues with shipping um, could be cost. Or time. I think this is an important one though and don't just assume that the, when 23 percent are leaving because of cost or time it it's not necessarily the cost is too high or the delivery time is too long it's more about it's not being presented at the cart step the next one 18 percent want to do some 
comparison. They think maybe the price is too high. 15% are going to go buy the item in store, which is a great thing. Uh, 6% there's payment issues or lack of payment options and 4% technical issues. Okay, so, so that gives us some more context and, and that helps us build what I call this content recipe for great card abandonment emails. So now what we need to do is we need to break down based on the knowledge we now have on those heuristics that we talked about at the beginning, plus this context of why people are leaving, we can start creating almost a, a content wish list for card abandonment emails. And I just want to talk about that quickly now. So <clears throat> the heuristics that we spoke about are really good for those people who are in early stage buying mode or who are just looking or researching and that I just talked about just now. So examples of that, well, email subject title is also a really good um, decision making influencer, especially if you apply a sense of urgency to it. Um, the next one is the customer reviews we've already talked about. The next one is the merchandising of the product. I've already talked about that. And the last one is emphasize the product is a bestseller, but of course, only if it's true. Consumers are smart. They know if it's not true or not. Okay. So the next, the next content recipe we need to talk about speaks to that slide about why people are leaving the shopping cart. We need to talk about delivery times or delivery options or even delivery messaging. We also need to talk about returns. We need strong calls to action. Security symbols. Remember on that slide it talked about there are some potential issues with payment. We want to be able to give people comfort or assurances that um, your, their payment will be secure. Support content is also a really important one too. There are just people who will do all of their researching online but will buy in store. And there's, there's a large audience like that. And to have a, a phone number or a way to reach out to retailers is another device that helps with card abandonment emails. So you now you're thinking, oh my gosh, there's a lot of content here we need to pull together. And how can I elegantly present this both on a desktop and more importantly, as we now know, smartphone screens? Well, I think what we need to do is we need to just quickly look at the hierarchy is what I call it, this content hierarchy in terms of the most important or what should be placed at the top of the email and cascading downwards. And these are my recommendations on how to structure or build a content hierarchy. So you've got the brand at the top, which of course is really important. Um, Greg from Bronto had a good example in one of his earlier emails where he showed the main navigation presented in the header, also really important. Um, present an introduction at, in your brand voice, but make sure that that intro is really concise. Call to action, ideally above the fold. The product that you're trying to sell, of course. The heuristic content in whatever form it takes and whatever um, form of content that you have access to, of course. Then we have the delivery return support content and the security content. So look, what I thought would be a really good idea and, and wrapping up now is giving you some examples of some abandonment carts, some real life examples. And again, like I said, Greg from Bronto's got um, presented a really good example earlier, but here's some other good ones. And wanted to start with ASOS. And we've already seen ASOS um, earlier in this presentation, but this is a uh, good example of one of their cart abandonment emails. And look, these, these examples aren't going to have the entire content recipe, but they definitely have um, highlights of which I want to point out. With ASOS, you've got the don't forget about me, which is in their brand voice, absolutely. You've got the get me call to action. But what I really like about this email is how they've just presented free delivery and easy returns. It's not design heavy, but with the way that they've placed those key content elements, it will have impacts. Um, Greg from Bronto also talked about the, the power of incentives and the card abandonment email on the far right of this slide is an example of a retailer utilizing um, incentives to initiate action.
On this slide, we've got some good examples. The, the card abandonment email on the left is from a, a pet retailer. And of course, um, this retailer has done a really good job because this consumer has left dog items in their cart. So they have presented the dog. And I, I think this is a good example of that, what Greg said earlier about striking that emotion piece is really effective in these emails, definitely. And um, pet people are a great example of how you can really get that emotional connection. The black milk uh, card abandonment email, the one in the middle, I really like this one. Um, it's, some of you may think that this is a pet retailer. In fact, it's, a, it's a, a young woman's apparel retailer, but they felt that this um, emotion striking tactic would work for this young female audience. And they don't even have a picture of the product, but they got this really cute um, puppy. Um, the card abandonment email on the right, the retailer called Joy, is a really interesting example of, they've got the product that was left in the cart at the top, but what they've also done is they've presented similar products below, which is again, they're, they're thinking that maybe that product was not quite right. Let's give other examples. The last example I want to show you is one from Fab, and this is my favorite one, probably because it it's a great example of multiple content elements coming together to drive that action of people um, clicking on this email and going back and purchasing. You've got a great title to initiate that action. It says, we're still holding the Angus Queen bed gray for you. Act fast if you want it. Fantastic. You've got the shipping, the returns, and smile. It's guaranteed message. Still in brand voice, but it gives you those really good assurances. And then below the brand, you've got smile, it's still for sale, which again gives the consumer comfort that whatever promotion event that they saw this product on, the retailer is still going to honor it. Fantastic. And then down below, they've got a clickable phone number and an email call to action. So look, that's really it for me. And, and in terms of final thoughts from my perspective, I think that really the most important message I'd like to send to everybody listening is the card abandonment email piece is a massive opportunity, but it's that it takes thought and consideration to take consumers who are time poor and who are bombarded with emails every single day to take the time um, and the effort to come back to you. So you better send a good message to make that effort worth their while. Thank you very much. Yeah, and just to add to that, uh, great content, Greg. Uh, you know, consumers are changing, and Greg Randall just mentioned that, uh, you know, people are being bombarded with emails, and that's not necessarily a bad thing because you're one of those people who's sending emails. It's a good thing that they're open to getting those emails, but they do expect relevant experiences now. They expect those messages to be relevant. But as Greg's point, if they're hitting and being hit with these emails all the time, if you can make your messages, both life cycle, promotional, whatever can be a little bit more relevant to their needs, to their obstacles, to their motivations, they will recognize that. And I'll guarantee you that when you get emails or they get emails and they see five different brands there and you're one of those brands and your messages are always more relevant than the others, you'll be the go-to. It'll be the easy swipe to the lead on their phone for the other brands. So the way you do that is to question those best practices. They're still best practices. They'll still work, but people are smart and they're savvy and they're catching up with this. So think about ways to make that relevancy happen, to be memorable, and to really speak your customer's voice. And if you do that, you'll be extremely successful with your email program. So at this point, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to us. I think we have time for some questions now. Um, so we'll turn it over, and hopefully you guys have some good ones for us. Thank you, Greg and Greg, for a very insightful presentation. Um, I certainly learned a lot about lifecycle messages this morning. We have quite a few questions queued up. Um, the first one is directed to Greg Zakowitz. Uh, Greg, you mentioned adding a fourth abandoned basket message. How many is too many, and are you worried about annoying the customer or having them unsubscribe? Yeah, very common question I get, um, not only with basket abandonment, but also with um, welcome series, how many is too many? The answer is 
there's really no set number for it, and having that fourth or fifth abandoned card message is really somewhat uncharted territory. So, you know, just monitor the, met the metrics for it, adjust your timing. I have had a couple clients implement fourth messages. Some do it only for the holiday season. Some started with the holiday season and kept it year round because of the success they, they saw with it. So, when you do it, again, look at the metrics. Make sure the unsubscribe rate's not going up. Make sure those complaint rates aren't going up. They're well within your normal range, um, if not even lower. But always keep in mind, if you're going to send them a promotional message anyways, I'd rather send them a more relevant abandoned card message versus a promotional batch and blast message. It's going to speak to the consumer more. So there's really no answer for you, which is a bad answer to give. Uh, but experiment with it. And if you're cautious, just start a little slow. Add the fourth one. You can always add a fifth or just kind of adjust the timing of the fourth. My guess is you're probably not going to touch anything over five, and four will probably probably be, if you have more than three, the number you, you settle with. I have another question here. Um, this one is for Greg Randall. Um, what is the cart abandonment rate these days, and is it across all retail types? And also, how big a problem is this? Yeah, it's so first off, it does vary. Um, but if, if we're to look at generally across retail, um, it, it's, it varies between 60 and 80 percent. And this is why it's such a big opportunity. IBM did a study not too long ago and found that department store retailers in America, on average, was, um, their, their shopping cart conversion rate was under 25 percent. So, um, and this is where the opportunity is. Now, travel sites will have a higher abandonment rate because you just have this price comparison culture with travel. But across across the board in retail, it's between 60 and 80%. Excellent. Um, I've got another question here for Greg Zakowitz. Um, with regard to the welcome series, how many messages is the right number? So this is a very similar question I mentioned before, welcome series and card abandonment, two, often, uh, two questions I get often. So um, same number, uh, or the same answer I guess with the, the card abandonment is there is no right answer. Um, traditionally what, what I see is you'll find that three or four messages in a welcome series is common and efficient enough to get your messaging across. I always advise clients that really look at the messaging you are sending to your customers. So you know, don't force a message, say, hey, our competitor has four messages, we need to do four, and then you force a message in there. You know, figure out what's going to separate you from them, hit those value adds, and make your messaging about the value adds and what makes you great and what makes them, uh, you know, have the idea to buy with you and not them. And my guess is you'll probably settle at three, four messages, uh, but there's really no right or wrong answer here. The one thing certainly to keep in mind is you don't want to send promotional messages while you're sending those welcome series messages. You want those automated messages to do their job. They're speaking to someone at a very specific stage of their interaction with you. So if you have, say, seven different messages sending every two days, you're now looking at 12 days before they get a marketing message. That may be too long because you want to strike while the iron's hot. Um, so three probably works better for you in that case. But just don't force the, force the messaging. Figure out what works best for you. And my guess is you'll probably settle around three or four. Okay. Well, um Thanks to uh, everyone for joining this insightful and val valuable webinar. Um, that's all the time we have for questions today. Um, thank you also to both the Greeks this morning for presenting the webinar. Um, just a bit of housekeeping, this uh, video will be available soon offline for those who want access to it or, or miss the webinar as well. Um, please sign up to our newsletter if you haven't already for any upcoming webinars that could be of help to you and your business at www.powerretail.com.au. I'm signing out now. I hope you all have a lovely day.